So yeah, hi. Um, today I'm going to talk about building a collaborative audio editor based on the Web Audio API. This is actually the, the topic of my thesis and the normal topic is like this, so I shorten it already. So you know, if you're working in uni, you have like long titles. So uh, I'm Jan, I'm um, the DevTone on Twitter. This is my website and I'm a front-end developer from Berlin. And I don't really have a musical background. So if I'm saying something about notes and like chords and everything, which I might not, it might be wrong, um, don't judge me, but I, I'm, I'm passionate about music and I used to play in a band when I was younger, like nine years ago. And um, that's uh, why I chose this topic for um, my thesis. And let's, let's talk about uh, audio on the web and how it all started. Like in the beginning, like back in the days, does anyone remember background sound? It was an element, oh yeah. It was like, it's not a standard element, but it was in IE and you could like play MIDI files in, on your website, it was horrible. It's like marquee and blink, it's gone, finally. Although I want blink back. Uh, so <laughs> then there was like object and embed, so you could lose, use like Java applets or Flash to play your WAV files, which is awesome on the web, never works. And then finally we got audio, the audio tag, which allowed us to stream and play and kind of control audio. But this is, all the three of them, they were just really useful to, to play audio and not to manipulate audio. And then there was the audio data API, something that Firefox, like the Firefox guys invented. And you had like raw access to raw audio data, finally, but it was like, I haven't really looked into it, but for some reason, one guy from Google said, no, the API kind of sucks. I will do a new one and I will call it Web Audio API. And this is a much easier to use API that we have now and which is really, really powerful because um, it gives us, I call it low level access to all things audio. But for people who do audio programming, it's like really high level, but I'm a JavaScript developer. So for me, like looking at bits is really, really low level. And it, it allows us to create sounds from scratch, like really creating music from bits and streams. Uh, we can manipulate audio with filters. Um, we can, which is really important, time sounds precisely. They have an, uh, an own timing model. And there's like tons of other cool stuff, which I will not mention, but like spatial audio for games, if, you, uh, if there's a shot on this direction, you can hear it. Um, but I, I will talk about how, how can we finally, like there were some really nice demos with the Web Audio API, but how can we use it to do something like that we can use to produce music? And for that, I analyzed some audio editors because they have years of development and they have best practices, so it's easy to, to cheat how they did it. Like there are common interface patterns and I wanted to find out what is the, the minimum feature set that like a web audio or audio editor should have. And for that, like I looked at GarageBand, which is really famous and it has a really simple layout. You have like tracks and a timeline, you have a play button in the top. And if you look at other ones like Ableton, it's kind of the same, like you have tracks, many more, and, but you have the labels on the other side. But you have like previews, okay, I, I see a pattern here. Then you have reason, which is the same. So it's like, okay, it's really easy to, to build an interface for, for audio editors, like to cheat and steal their best practices. And what I came up, like, so you, you always have a timeline. So you can see when, you t when your sounds play and um, you have a preview, like if it's a drum preview, you have like dots and everything, or you have like a wave sound, uh, a wave form, um, if it's like audio sound. And you have like tracks as rows, so like you have a lot of rows and each one is a track. And so the basic things that you need to have is like you have to have some way to record audio in your uh, application. You have to be able to import data. You have to have like some drums and like some synthesizers. And uh, this is what I came up with, uh, quick, 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 quick demo. So on the top, you have like a play button, stop button. This is volume. This is uh, something else, uh, zoom. So I can make it all bigger and smaller. And I have tracks here. I have previews. Uh, I can alter the tracks. Um, 
I can play and then there's like a timeline going from here to here. Um, I can add tracks, uh, I have a file browser. So this is like the really basic thing that we, we need to have. But how does it actually work? And for that, I will start with the recording. So we need to record audio because imagine we're a band and we want to jam a bit. I need to record my, uh, my voice track. And for that, I need to get like live audio feedback so I can adjust like the microphone and everything to um, like as a musician, you are very picky about uh, how the sound of your microphone is. You need to have like a visualization for that and you need to upload the things to the server and you need to select parts of an audio. Like imagine you have a recording and then in the beginning you did a mistake and you kind of don't want to have that in your sound. So you need to be able to select bits and pieces and you need to import other audio. And uh, let's do this. Oh, I already, like this is, um, I can just remove it. Not really. Okay. <laughs> I can do this. Better? So yeah, let, let's add a new recording track. Let's call it, oh, uh, wait, wait. And now I want to record something. Um, yes, now we need to allow the microphone access. And then here you can see uh, live feedback of the um, frequency spectrum. So if I, if I had like a, a studio microphone now, I could uh, tune in a bit. And what I can do is like I can record. It's like, hello, Scotland Jazz. And I can upload the recording. And then it might be somewhere down here. And I can pull it over, cancel this. Now I need to adjust the thingy again. And let's do that, that, and Scotland Chess. Yeah. Hello, Scotland Chess. And then if you like, that's a long pause. So it would be like, yes. I don't want the thing at the end. I don't want the click. So I can say, hello, Scotland Chess. That's much nicer. So this is like the, the, the really, really simple way to um, just record and everything. Uh, but how does it work? Um, obviously, this is just the UI. So in the Web Audio API, everything is based on a node graph. And what we need to do here is like we need to get the user media, which can be the microphone or like if you can plug in a guitar, you can get the same thing. And then you get a media stream uh, from which one you can use an, an analyzer node, like an analyzer node which tells you a bit about the, the metadata about the audio, and then you can visualize it with a canvas, which I just did. And you can use like Recorder.js, which uses web workers to record the bits of sound, like the input stream immediately. And like it uses web workers to, so that it's really uh, responsive at the same time. So you can still use the user interface while recording. And this is the reason why this is not working in Internet Explorer because it's using so many, like it's using Web Worker, Web Audio, and like if you if you build a um, an audio editor, it will still for for many many months and maybe years it will still be limited to modern versions of Chrome, which is sad, or Firefox of course, but yeah, so no IE6, no never. Uh, the next big thing is is drums and. If you want to program drums, you need to have full control over speed and the sound of the drums. And you, you want to have like complex and varying drum loops. And therefore, you need different drum sets and exact timing. So there's nothing worse than a drummer who's like kind of off the beat. Like that works in free jazz, but not like in most other uh, music genres. So I came up with this. This is the preview for drums and you get like a user interface for different patterns. They are named from A to F and like a simple pattern would be this. It has 120 BPM, 16 slots. And I can say I want to use the, the regular drum kit. Let's uh, play this a bit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really easy beat now. Um, Right, right, it's super easy, um, but you can do like some more like trap music. Or... So this is all done just using the Web Audio API and like four audio files and um, 
You get a variety by combining like patterns in order. Like you see AAA, BBB. And if I take like number D to this, you can see that it expanded here. So by allowing like a pattern order, you have a huge variety of, um, like you can be very creative by using just one uh, drum sample here. And this, is, this also works for the general playback. So if I play, oops, if I play this. So this is representing um, the real files that are being played right now. And this is all the same time, like the animations and the preview always match because the animations is using CSS3 animations and like to be really smooth and um, also very exact. And um, the sound is using the, the timing system that is used in the web audio. And what that means is like timing. There's no set timeout, no set interval. And like imagine Joey Jordison, like uh, Slipknot's drummer, based on JavaScript timing would be so much worse. Like, oh my God. And so that's why they have their own timing system. And this is how it works. So you create a buffer source, which is like you load a file and then you want to play it. You have to specify when you want to play it. Like you can say, I want to play it in 1.3486 blah, blah, seconds. And it's really exact. And you can define an offset and a duration. So it's like a fine grained axis on how you want to time um, your playback. And this is what was missing for a long, long time. And the best part is it's executed in a different um, uh, thread. So it doesn't interact with your, like if you have uh, heavy computation in your main UI thread, which is of course always bad, uh, the audio will still be exact, exactly timed. Um, so the third thing is synthesizers. Synthesizers are like instruments that create electronic music. And this is the mini Moog, which is kind of a pioneering uh, instrument from uh, Moog Industries. And it uses oscillators here and filters and kind of frequencies to create sound. But what does it all mean? Like, what, what is an oscillator? An oscillator is just like a wave that oscillates all the time at a specific frequency and this creates sound. Like this is uh, 60 Hertz, like of, of course, like slower, but even your speakers, they oscillate when they, when they do sounds. How does it sound like? Um, not so good, I can tell you now, but just to get an expert, like to, to get to know how it sounds. So it's a sine wave. So this is the basis of how we should make music now. D does it work? Yes, it does, of course. So like a synthesizer is always a combination of more than one oscillator. So the synthesizer I'm, I'm using in my audio uh, editor uses three oscillators and they have like controls, they have an envelope, I will get to that. And then they go through a filter, like you mix three rich sounds and then you put it into a filter to shape it and then in the end you have like an LFO which I come to back and then you pass it to the speakers and I said envelope here what is it an envelope is if you play a, a sine wave then it's just static like it's the same volume from A to Z but an envelope allows you to define a curve that gives a more natural sound to your um, to the sine wave by adjusting the volume. So you can emulate um, a keyboard, or no, no, a piano kind of thingy. But let's look at how this works. So this is the preview for a synthesizer. Uh, you can arrange notes here, you can make them smaller, bigger, and add new ones and remove them. But I wouldn't um, talk about this, maybe more about sound shape. Like, so now it sounds like this. Uh, can you all see that? Cool. So this is a um, really, really simple sound now and you can do chords. You can't see it like I'm playing it on my uh, keyboard. I'm really sorry. You can do something like that and you can 
pass it to a filter, like now it was a low pass filter, so it was only allowing lower frequencies, but if you pass it through a high pass filter, it will only allow higher frequencies, so it sounds different. Oh, I broke it. That happens. Um, nah, whatever. You, you get the idea, I think. Um, and you can like detune them to get like more different sound. And then there's an LFO, like which is really popular at the moment in dubstep. Uh, an LFO is uh, a low frequency oscillator, like an oscillator that oscillates at uh, a frequency that humans normally cannot hear. Like I think the, um, the human range of hearing is about like 40 hertz and an oscillate like an LFO oscillates at zero like 1 to 20 so normally we can't hear but we can use this is kind of crazy you, you can use a, a wave to manipulate param, uh, parameters parameters like for example the the volume and I will just show you what it does so it goes up and down all the time um, that puts in some variation. You can also alter this. Uh, as I said, I don't have a musical background. Um, <laughs> so if there's somebody playing keyboard or piano, they would have done a much better job. But this is how, an, how a synthesizer works, basically, and how I develop that. Uh, but as I said in the very first slide, there's also a collaboration feature. And I was really excited to do that because I made a collaborative website before and I thought like, yeah, I did it the last time I did like, I'll lock all the things like somebody's working on the synthesizer so nobody else is allowed. But that's not really nice. Like you're in a creative process and you have to, it's really frustrating. You have to wait until you can work on the notes and like, that's not really collaboration. So also if you lock like a certain element, and like you have to synchronize lock messages. So you have to be notified when somebody's unlocking it. But if that message gets lost on the network, you're lost like forever because you will never be notified that it's unlocked. So like locking is not really a good solution. And when you start um, searching for, for synchronization features, like you will definitely come along operational transformation, which is like, you have a party A, a party B, they start up with the same document and then they like, here he adds an F and this person removes the H and then they kind of pass around the, the, the transformations that they did on the, um, on the document and then some algorithms figure out how to uh, put them together correctly so that they have the same state at all times. But as you can see here, if they edit at the same time and then they just broadcast it, they end up with different documents, which is, ha. Huh. But so operation transformation, it's like a standard. It's used everywhere in Google Drive, sub -ether edit, and there's lots of research, like years of research on that topic. And it's implemented in ShareJS, which is a Node.js library, which you can just plug into your web application and you have synchronization. But it's kind of really complicated if you want to understand how it works. And for my thesis, I had to explain how it works. And I did not really have the time to, to read 100 uh, papers on that. So I ditched it, although it works. Um, no offense. Uh, but I found this. Uh, it's called differential synchronization. It's an algorithm developed by Neil Fraser, who works at Google. And um, looking at this, I immediately thought, that's much easier, right? <laughs> So um, you basically start off like a client has a document, a server has a document. When they start off, it's the same. And then they have a, a shadow document which represents the server's uh, state and the, the shadow on the server represents the client state and they um, send diffs around and it's always a, a circle and everything and it's much simpler and the, the circle has so many, um, um, the, the circle makes sure that it's synchronized at all the time because of some constraints which I will not 
uh, explain now, but it solves the edge cases of how do I broadcast the, the changes uh, altogether. It has less features than like operational transformation, uh, and it works like a charm uh, with AngularJS, at least for me. So I had the problem, so I have a huge JSON document for all the arrangement data in the editor, and I did that with Backbone, and I had like a huge complicated uh, model tree, and then I had to apply patches on a backbone model tree didn't really work. Then I ditched it, used Angular, and I, it was basically four hours of work. And I had the, like the, the example working immediately. So I needed no code to really adopt to the, um, to the synchronization part because it's done via the two-way binding altogether, like all the time. So that was really cool. And I didn't like Angular before, but this convinced me, kind of. Uh, but why do we need collaboration? Um, imagine you're a band and you're not like, you have to work, re work remotely. It's really easy to brainstorm and like melodies, it's easier to brainstorm. It's auto save and auto backup because it's on a central server, but that's not like, so, so you don't have offline access, that really sucks. Um, anyway, uh, let, let's, let's demonstrate that. Ooh, that's not part of the demo. So I um, imagine I'm a bass player now. Uh, I have the idea of like this melody, melody. And <laughs> can you all see that? Good. And the melody goes something like this. Um, put that away, put that away. So it's something like this. Oh no, I'm a keys player. I'm not a bass player. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I used to be a bass player before. Wait, bear with me, bear with me. Uh -huh. Get rid of that. So yeah, I'm a synthy guy and I came up with like really gothic intro thingy. It's like, I like that. I like that. Yeah, make that too. Yeah, sound, sounds pretty good. And then like your, your band mates, they pop up and they're like, dude, I really like what you did. Um, so I'm in the, in the other browser uh, now and um, <sighs> the mouse stopped working. Oh, there it is again. So now I'm the, now I'm the bass player. And I'm like, yeah, I, I really dig that. Um, the mouse is not working. So I came up with a bass line that goes like this. And we can skip this part now. And so basically, we're jamming together, but we're not in the, on the same um, um, in the same place. And now I can also be like a guitar player. No, what the? F <laughs> I didn't say the word. <laughs> and then I can just pop in my guitar and say like, ah, this is a funky riff. That could work, really. So we're all jamming together, and then in the end, it's all something like. Something like this, if you're a band. Uh, but yeah, so this is how you can use it. Um, I think I ran over the time already. But there's so much more that I could not show. There's like a schedule, scheduling algorithm so that you can, uh, which is needed for the playback and you can export your data. Uh, you have a synchronization protocol that I did not show. I like barely showed how the synchronization works. And yeah, more that did not fit into 20 minutes. So I wrote a thesis on this. You can read it, it's online. And thanks for your attention.